Hello and welcome back to Why You're Wrong, a new show where I look at some of football's biggest narratives to separate fact from fiction and let you know what you might be missing, as well as pointing out some mistakes of my own. And on today's show, we try to do the impossible and make you feel sympathy, maybe, for one of the most unlikable teams in football. Bayern are normally the least messy of the big clubs. Sure, they've had managerial whiffs in the last few years. Niko Kovac and Carlo Ancelotti never quite got a safe seat in the beer garden, but as a rule, the club behaves with the unhurried assuredness of a team which can win the league in its sleep. But not this season. With nine league games left and a Champions League quarterfinal looming, the German giants parted ways with Bayern fan and coaching Wunderkind Julian Nagelsmann and replaced him with Thomas Tuchel, a Bavarian himself, born just an hour outside Munich, and perhaps better suited to the cagey chess of trying to win a European crown. But that wasn't his only job, as prior to their thrashing of Dortmund over the weekend, Bayern were not only not running away with the Bundesliga, but were a point behind BVB at the summit of the table. The last time Bayern weren't top of the league that late in a season was in March 2019, four years, 135 games, and four domestic titles ago. And Tuchel getting such a big victory in his first test makes the narrative easy to write. Nagelsmann made a mess, the former Chelsea man is cleaning it up. It's almost too neat. So you're probably expecting me to go on and on about XG and how Bayern actually underperformed and got bad bounces under Nagelsmann and blah blah blah. And to be fair, I am going to do that. But maybe not in the way you might be anticipating. Normally, a team underperforming does so in one or both of two major ways. They're allowing more goals than the stats would predict or scoring fewer than they should. But neither is the case here. Defence has been as expected, before the worst dressed man in football left, Bayern let in 27 from 27.3 xG, no story there. But the attack is, on the face of it, even less of an explanation for why this season is a race. There's been a lot of focus on Lewandowski leaving as if the team is struggling to score goals, but that's the opposite of the case. Bayern are creating less xG per 90 than they did last year, 2.1 down from 2.6, which is a really big drop, but they have been finishing lethally turning 53 xG into 72 actual goals under Nagelsmann, meaning they're scoring at a marginally higher rate than they did last year when they bagged 97 in just 34 games. Everyone has been on fire. Before Tuchel came in, Musiala scored 11 from 6.7 xG, Chupamotting 10 from 5.5, Nabri 9 from 6.9. In fact, across the squad, only four players, Alfonso Davies, Goretzka, Thomas Muller and Sadio Mane, are underperforming their stats. Not even Arsenal or Napoli are running this hot. So where's the bad luck? Well, part of it was Dortmund getting breaks. Their numbers suggest they should have only just over half their plus 22 goal difference and be around 9 to 10 points back of their Bavarian rivals, not basically matching them. If they were getting results according to their quality, they'd be out of contention, though Bayern would be facing competition from RB Leipzig, whose luck is on the other end of the spectrum. But regardless, Bayern have been suffering from their own injustices, and to see what's really going on, we have to look at their individual games. One of the reasons their goals for column looks so impressive is that they've scored five or more six times this season. And when you do that, you tend to overperform. It's actually much more common for a team to score five goals than to rack up 5xG in a match. But it seems like Bayern's finishing only shows up in these matches. Against Bochum and Freiburg, for example, Nagelsmann's side netted 12 from six expected goals. But look at their draws and losses. That's a lot of matches, so here's the breakdown. Bayern created more, according to the stats, in five of these 10 games. And while across the campaign they've been lethal in front of goal, in these fixtures they netted 14 from 16 expected goals. So suddenly they're below average at finishing. To some extent, this is inevitable. In games where you've been unlucky, you're going to get bad results. But you'd expect your poor finishing to be spread relatively evenly across the season. Sure, sometimes a shanked shot turns a win into a draw or a draw into a loss, but sometimes it only means you win 1-0 instead of 2-0 and you forget about it. What you don't expect is this Jekyll and Hyde streakiness, only scoring 88% of the goals the stats would predict in these fixtures, but scoring 120% the rest of the time. Perhaps there was a real problem behind the scenes. Perhaps Nagelsmann arriving to training on a skateboard really did rattle the highly experienced superstars at FC Hollywood. Perhaps his outfits were a problem, which I could definitely understand. Perhaps his rumoured off-field disagreements with Manuel Neuer turned the squad against him. Or perhaps the players have grown apathetic after a decade of uninterrupted success. But what we can say is that the level of this team under Nagelsmann was excellent and gave no indication that the manager was out of his depth 
or making mistakes, or that these issues would persist for the rest of the campaign, let alone into future seasons. If he'd stayed, he could easily have beaten Dortmund and contended for the UCL. Instead, it might be Tuchel who tastes domestic and continental glory. Nagelsmann frankly deserved better than his P45. Bayern's loss will have to be someone else's gain. When VAR was approved for use in the 2019-20 Premier League season, I thought it was a step in the right direction. Football is generally extremely conservative and hostile to change, even when it's obviously sensible. Look at the fight over extra substitutes post-pandemic. So this felt like a huge hurdle to have cleared, paving the way for quicker, better decisions, an easier life for refs, and less griping about injustice overall. Unfortunately, the implementation of the system, especially coupled with adjustments to the offside and handball rules, has been largely poor. While I don't take too much of an issue with the so-called armpit offside, offside is offside, though personally I'd only use feet to decide where the line goes, it is miserable that supporters now can't celebrate goals properly, instead waiting to see if some irrelevant infraction will see them chalked off. While on-pitch decisions are meant to stand when the situation is ambiguous, we have seen VARs overrule the ref on the field from time to time. And frankly, it feels like no one has any clue what will be given as a handball anymore. That's ridiculous. We can always argue about pushes, for example, because it's hard to gauge force. But when you've been watching the game for over a quarter of a decade, you should know a handball when you see one. And the key aims of the handball rule and the offside rule often seem to have disappeared from our minds. They're about stopping unfair advantage. Instead, we now seem focused on technical issues which shouldn't actually have an effect on the game. How far down the arm the sleeve comes, what is a natural position, etc. Now, to be clear, I still hold out hope for a lot of this. Automatic offside decisions should take a bunch of problems off the table, and overtime rules can be tweaked and the system streamlined to become both faster and more consistent, so long as there's the will to do so. But right now it feels like all we've done is multiply the number of decision makers fans can get angry at, and the promise of VAR, a fairer, less error-prone game, simply makes wrong calls even more galling. Apologies from PG Moll and suspensions of referees don't restore our faith in the system, they just irritate us further. A version of VAR is out there which can improve football, but until referee pay is upped, attracting a better standard of official, and rules are clarified, we'll be stuck with long delays and stupid errors. On this, my optimism was misplaced. So that's our show for this week. Thank you for watching and hit us up with your suggestions of other things I got wrong as well as your most treasured football opinions, and they might make a future episode of the show. Get your entries in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.